So as I mentioned, we're going to go through today moving from feed-forward n-gram neural network models to recurrent neural network models. This is going to be very useful for us when we're wanting to do language modeling in general. One of the big reasons why is that recurrent neural networks are able to capture a much richer view of the context in which a word is occurring or in which we're predicting a word to occur than an n-gram model. So an n-gram model by definition is looking at a limited history. So we've got a Markov assumption and we're looking at a limited history. So uh, an n-gram model is going to be the probability of a word at time t given a word at time, for example, t minus 1. Okay. So that would be an example of a bigram language model. A trigram language model would also look at the word at t minus 2. Okay? So given two previous words of context, what is the probability of any particular next word coming along? Does that make sense? Everybody good? Okay. So this is an approximation of something else, which is the probability of word at time t given the entire history from the beginning of the sequence to the present. Okay, So in a trigram language model, we are defining the model to be an to as an approximation of this larger probability sequence. It's an approximation. It's not reality. So I probably should have an approx here. Okay, so it's approximately equal to this based on the Markov assumption that we're making. A recurrent neural network is going to define the right, is going to model the right hand side exactly without making this approximation. Okay? So we are going to come up with a model that actually does this. So what is the probability of the word at the current time given all of the words that preceded in the sequence? Now in principle, this could be defined over all of the words in an entire discourse. That's not normally done. It could be. But we are going to restrict ourselves so that the definition of a sequence here is going to be a single sentence. Later on in this class, we'll move to morphology, and the W's here could be characters within a word, they could be phonemes within a word, or they could be morphemes within a word. Okay, So later on we'll move to where the unit of the sequence is a word, but we're going to start off with the assumption that the, that the unit sequence is a sentence. Okay, Everybody good? Questions so far? So right now W represents a word within a sentence. Okay? All right. So, let's move back over here. So, 
The bit in gray represents a one-hot vector over the units that we're working with. So if we're working with characters within a word, then the tokens here would represent characters, and that's what I've got up here at the moment. If instead these are words within a vocabulary of a language, then these one-hot vectors would represent things like entire words. If you are using a billion word corpus, this is a problem. Okay? Why is this a problem if you use a billion word corpus? Well, because the length of that gray vector has to be a billion. Now, what do you do to get around this problem? You restrict your vocabulary size. So if we're dealing with characters within a word, this isn't too bad of a problem usually. Because in any given language, there is usually a relatively small set of characters that are actually used in the language. Um, and, or, or at least that are likely to show up in any given document. And you could model, like if we're dealing with English, you could model German S set or accented E or uh, A with a circle over it as out of vocabulary, okay? And if you happen to have a Swedish word come in that has a rounded vowel, you just treat that as out of vocabulary. Um, if we're dealing with words, then we have, to, then, then we are more likely to run into this problem. And so we solve that by saying, we are gonna restrict our vocabulary to the N most frequent words in the language, where n is some relatively high number, but not a ridiculously high number. So something more on the order of 40 or 50,000 most frequent words. Yes? I have no idea how this would be handled in care. So, does anybody know on approximately what order the number of characters that are frequently used in Chinese would be? Just 3,000 to 5,000? 5, okay, so if it's 3,000 to 5,000, that's totally fine. There, that's, that's well with, we, we should be able to handle on the order of thousands of things, no problem. Um, So, so the, the, the question was, what would you do if, you had, if Chinese regularly used millions of different characters in everyday text? Then you'd maybe have to do something different here. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, if... Right, so you could convert them. So if it were the case that Chinese, for example, regularly used millions or hundreds of millions of characters, then you might need to do something like convert it to pinyin first. Right. Yeah, so if you're, if you're dealing with number of words in Chinese, then you've got the same problem that you do in English. And you just pick the N most frequent words, where N is some number that's relatively large, as large as you can afford without overflowing your GPU memory. Okay. 
All right, so we've picked a vocabulary size, okay? And I'm going to refer to the vocabulary size as this, okay? Okay, so the vertical bars are to denote size of. So size, that, that gray vector conceptually has the dimensionality of the size of the vocabulary. And this is going to be the, so far nothing has changed from the n-gram language models that we've done before, the feed-forward models. Okay. Now, the blue vector here is our embedded vector. So the gray vector conceptually consists of all zeros except for one node where there's a one. Okay? So if we wanted to refer to the word yellow, then inside there is a one and everything else is zeros, okay? Now, in our network, we're going to present as input, conceptually, this gray vector, and that then, for any given node here, is gonna be a weighted, uh, a weighted summation so the value of this node here is going to be this, the value at this vector times the weight connecting those two nodes plus the value at this node times the weight connecting those two nodes, and so on, all the way down here. Okay. So that is going to represent a single dot product. This gray vector is a vector. This weight, this weight, this weight, and all of the weights on down here represent another vector, conceptually. Those two vectors are the same length, the size of the vocabulary. And when you multiply together two vectors using their dot product, that is equivalent to this weighted summation. The first two numbers, the, the vector, the first value at element 1 in vector A times element 1 in vector B plus element 2 times element 2 and so on. Okay. So far this is exactly the same as what we've dealt with. This is just review. Yes. They are initially random numbers. The, yeah, those are the weights are all going to be randomly initialized. Or if you have some good thing, good good values to start with, you can certainly use those. Um, okay. Now, when we consider the next node in the blue vector, it's also going to have all a set of weights associated with it. And so the whole connection, the whole set of connections between the gray vector and the blue one can be represented as a matrix, a weight matrix, an embedding matrix, W sub E. Okay. So W sub E here is going to represent that weight matrix. And one of the dimensions in that matrix will be the size of the vocabulary. 
the other dimension will be the size of this layer. So the number of nodes in this layer. Okay? And in principle, we can actually omit the gray box, the gray vector, these one-hot embeddings, and simply use integer indices to index directly into the weight matrix to access, so when we're uh, accessing here, uh, yeah, so, so we can access, if we want the blue vector for there, we're accessing a single row in the weight matrix, okay? Corresponding to the blue vector if there's a one here in this gray vector, okay? If that does not immediately make sense to you, I encourage you to take some time afterwards with pencil and paper and small, a, a small weight matrix and do it by hand. Work it out by hand. Randomly initialize a weight vector with maybe a vocabulary of three things and a weight matrix of size four so that you've got a three by four matrix and convince yourself that, that those two things are equivalent by working out the math by hand. Okay? All right. Now, it's time for another vector. No. That is a good question. The blue one is not a hidden layer, it is an embedding layer, okay? What I'm about to draw is a hidden layer. Okay, so let's make this a different size just so that we can see that it, in principle, can be a different size. All right, now we're going to introduce a hidden layer. Again, so far, everything's the same as we had before, okay? So for every node in this new hidden layer, there is a connection from every node in the previous layer, okay? These totally do not have to be the same size. Now in some books, you may see that they are the same size, but that is for notational convenience, not for any principled reason. Or there may be a principled reason for it, but it, it doesn't have to be that way. Okay? All right. So now we've got a new weight matrix. Okay? Now, what's the dimensionality of that weight matrix? Well, one of the dimensions clearly has to be the size of the blue layer. And the other has to be the size of the red layer. 
Okay. Now it might be that those two numbers are the same thing, in which case you'd have a square matrix, which is completely fine, but it doesn't have to be. Okay. All right. Now we've got what else is there in addition to this weighted multiplication in the red layer that we did not have in the blue layer? We talked about this last time. When I'm calculating the value at this node, I do the weighted summation, and then I do something else. Uh, yes, you do the bias, uh, but something else after you add the bias in. The activation function. Yes, so we apply the activation function. Okay, so the activation function, let's pick one and let's just say we're using ReLU. Okay, so inside, after that weighted summation, we have the ReLU operation. Okay. And this is a hidden layer. Okay, so far so good? Okay. All right, so now we add something new. So previously we would have had another layer over here that is going to be our output layer. Okay, so this is going to be our output layer. Oops. And the output layer is also going to be the dimensionality of the vocabulary. Okay, and so in the feed forward version of this, we connected the hidden layer directly to the output layer. Everybody recall that? Yes? Yes? Okay. And we can still do that. We can still predict. Okay. But the problem here is that there's, there's nothing to carry that unlimited history. So we wanted to bring with us some additional history so that we know not just the one previous word, which is what the gray layer is pro providing us with, but some summary of the history. Okay, So that we can tell that 
the next word in one context should have a different probability distribution than in some other context. Okay. The boy went to the... There's a relatively smaller universe of probable next words in that sentence than at the beginning of the sentence. So the blank at the beginning of a sentence, there's a lot more things that you can plausibly say. I'm just starting a sentence. The stock market crashed. The president tweeted. The universe began long ago versus the boy went to the, probably the park, the school, the track meet, okay? So we want to include that here somehow. All right, so let me see if I can zoom. I'm new to this program, so I can't guarantee. There we go. So, we're going to add one more bit of information here. And I mean that figuratively, not literally. You're adding at more than one bit of information. Okay, so we're going to add an additional red layer over here. This is going to represent the hidden layer that we most recently calculated. Okay, so let's start at the beginning and feed into the gray layer a special symbol meaning beginning of sentence. Okay, so right here we're going to assume that one of these nodes was beginning of sentence. Okay, so we start with beginning of sentence. Okay. And for beginning of sentence, we feed it through the embedding layer, we feed it through the hidden layer. Then we have a hidden, a hidden node, a hidden layer, a bunch of hidden nodes in a hidden layer. And we could even predict the next word at the output layer. Okay? So far, nothing has changed. We just predicted the first word in the sentence. Okay. What we're adding is when we predict the second word. So when we predict the second word, we're going to feed in to our one-hot embeddings, our one-hot numbers here, whatever word we predicted. Okay. And this again is in generation generation mode. If we're calculating the probability, we will do things a little bit differently, but we're right now going to take, so let's say we predicted the. The was the most likely word. Okay, so now we move our one from, whoops, here to here, okay, and we get the embedding layer for the, same as we did before, but now before we calculate 
this node's value, we're going to include something else. We're going to include this previous hidden layer. So this was the previ this was the hidden layer that we calculated in that first run through the network. We're adding a recurrence relationship. So we're going to connect this to here. and connect this to here. Yeah. But this, this represents a weight and again a weighted multiplication, a weighted addition. Okay. And you can think of this as two different weight matrix, two different weight matrices or one different or one weight matrix depending on how you want to think about it, how you want to do your accounting. Okay. If you want to think of it as two different weight matrix matrices, then you're going to have this one up here, up there that connects the blue to the red, and then a different one down here that connects the red to the red, and that one will definitely be a square matrix because the dimensionality will be the same on both sides. Okay. And this is a recurrent neural network. We are saving the hidden layer as we go. So, if we want to think of the bits at the top as a function where the weights are baked into the function, you could think of the forward pass through the upper layer as a function that takes a previous hidden layer, which is optionally null, because we don't need it for the first time through, and an integer representing a word, and produces a tuple as its result rather than a single item. One item in the tuple is going to be the predicted value at the output layer. The second item in the tuple is going to be the hidden layer. So we're going to return both the red vector and the green vector as output. And then in, if we put this in a for loop, if we put all of this work inside a for loop, the next time through the for loop, the green value, after applying softmax to get the most likely, and softmax and then selecting the top value, will give us the integer value that we will use the next time through here. And the red value that's returned as a result will give us the red layer here that we will use as input to the next call to this function. Yes. Okay. Let me let me let me pull up some uh, a a text editor, and we will code this. Okay. Or we will we will do some pseudo code. They are two, each one is a vector. They are conceptually similar. 
just in the way, same way that wt and wt minus 1 are similar. So let's, let's use some notation here. So red is h at t. So the hidden layer is denoted as h at time t. Okay. This previous hidden layer is h from time t minus 1. Does that help? Okay. So So let's define a function called RNN that takes as parameters So the parameters to this function are a word index, a word at time t minus 1, and a hidden vector from time t minus 1. Correct. The first time through, you could pass it a vector of zeros. And this function yields as its result h at time t and w at time t. More precisely, it provides h at time t and a probability distribution over w at time t, which you can then use to get w at time t. Okay? So that is the big picture. There are variants of this defining exactly how you make your connections. And for example, do you have those weights as one matrix or two matrices? But this is the general idea of a recurrent neural network for language modeling, specifically for prediction, for generation. Okay. Later on, we can talk about adding fancier things in the red layer. So if you see, see people talking or writing about LSTMs and GRUs, those are going to be replacements for our RNN function. Okay. But conceptually, they're there to solve the same kind of problem. Okay? Questions? Yes? Okay. I will stop the video then. <laughs>